Boy, the, uh, the sun being out just changes everything, doesn't it? You just feel a little more alive today than uh, you've been maybe in the last 12 days or so. So anyway, welcome to Tower Hill. If you're new here, a very special welcome to you. I wanted to add one more announcement. Some of you saw the absolutely ridiculous video that Pastor Chris and I did, <laughs> getting our thumbs ready for Ash Wednesday. Uh, so anyway, I want to make sure you know Ash Wednesday is actually on Valentine's Day at 730. Where else would you want to be? than church. But I will say this, last year was sort of wild. We, we had this, like triple the number of people that usually come to that service. It's a contemporary service. And I had to take all the ashes we had like in, in store, like in reserve, and dump them into the thing. And then it was just me, so it took forever. Now listen, there's going to be three pastors. It's going to go quick. So if that's what you're worried about, make sure. Uh, 7.30 on the 14th. All right, so today we are closing out this sermon series that we're calling Fixing the Code, how misconceptions about Jesus may have infected or even degraded our faith. And this happens accidentally over time. This happens just from, uh, you know, allowing me to mix metaphors, like barnacles on a boat. It just happens over time. Culture says all sorts of things about Jesus. And you hear all sorts of things about Jesus and spirituality and whatever. And sometimes we end up with some faulty code, barnacles on the boat, that just over time will cause the boat not to function properly. And this is true with our faith. And this all came, as you know if you've been tracking this series, from me dealing with just a teensy bit of computer code and the fact that if you get just a little bit wrong, the whole thing doesn't work. And this is true with our faith. If you build your faith on faulty code, it's not going to work. What do I mean? I mean if, let's say, your faith says something like, well, I believe that it's about what I do, that I, if I just do good enough, I'm just going to keep climbing, 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 and eventually I'll be good enough for Jesus to save me. And if you believe that, that's not the kind of faith that you can rest your soul on. That's not the kind of faith you can rest your life on. This was the problem that the Pharisees had. It's faulty code. You can't fully lean on the faulty code. It's just not going to work. And I think all of us have a little Pharisee in us, not on purpose, but it's like, well, things are going good in my life, and you know, I'm kind of everything's up and to the right, and so therefore God loves me, God cares about me, God is good. And then something happens, and we get a curveball, we get a challenge, we get an obstacle in the road, and we feel like, oh, wait a minute, maybe God's penalizing me for not being good enough, not being a good enough Christian. That's all Pharisee thinking. But here's the thing. If you can get a clearer picture of the original code, the version his very first followers knew, we can fix the errors. And we start to get to know the Jesus. This is why we're doing this series. Because maybe all along the way you're like, yeah, no, I don't think I have a problem with those codes that you brought up. But it's just a reminder that as we seek to live our faith, we want to make sure that we are following the real Jesus and not some degraded version of Jesus that we accidentally inherited or accidentally adopted. My goal is to share with you the version of Jesus his very first followers believed in, the source code, so that we can have the kind of faith we can rest our lives on. So last week we looked at this faulty code. If you missed it, want to go back and listen to last week. If you want to follow Jesus, you have to follow the rules Again, Pharisee thinking, this is the problem that Jesus was constantly trying to get them to see. And in the end, the fixing of the code is if you want to follow Jesus, you have to give him your heart, not just your compliance. I feel that one a little bit. Because it's a different thing, isn't it? You can do all the same things. You could come to church, you can, whatever you're going to do in your life, be generous, you could do, you could help others, all of that. But if it's not about your heart, if it's somehow about compliance, you're missing it. And it's easy to do, especially when we feel like church is something that we check off. Okay, good, you know? And that's, it's okay, but that's not what it's about. It's not just about compliance. It's about, I want the sort of heart that beats in rhythm with God's. Now, let's talk more about this today. Because I hear this a lot, and I'm going to touch on something that you may find a little bit offensive. My goal is not to offend you. My goal is to, is to challenge a certain way of thinking that thinks about how 
we attract good things in our lives. I've come up uh, against this quite a bit lately, which I think, honestly, is probably going to be a whole other sermon series I'm going to do. But let me start here. What I hear people say all the time is love and finding your true everything in life is about following your heart. Following your heart wherever it leads. Now, I'll say this. That's not inherently a bad thing. Obviously. I think God cares very much about our heart. And he wants us to feel this life the way that it's designed to be lived. But the problem is, is my heart leads me to some dumb places. I've been led to some bad relationships because I followed my heart. Bad. I've done all sorts of things. Oh, you know, the heart wants what the heart wants. Okay, okay, what does the heart want? Uh, Maybe, theoretically, the heart wants you to jump off a roof at homecoming into some bushes and theoretically hurt your legs so bad you think it's broken and probably wonder why later in life you have so many back problems. (laughs) Theoretically. (laughs) Theoretically. So, (laughs) I mean, the heart wants all sorts of stuff. But is that really the answer to what God wants for me in my life? I think kind of. I think it's half the answer. Or I've heard a lot of this lately. And I I went to to this cool retreat in New York City. It was an overnight. And I was in a room full of like authors and storytellers and everything. And I was one of the only Christians in the room. I was definitely the only pastor. And which is always awkward when you have to introduce and like say what you do, because you just see everybody's look like. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, but this, this one woman is very passionate about this project. She's working on this book that she's writing. She kept saying this. The universe gives you what your heart wants. The, the universe, like if you... It's all this law of attraction stuff. If you do the right thing, you're going to attract. The universe is going to give you the desires of your heart. And I had all sorts of questions. I, I wanted to stop and just be so annoying, and I didn't, you know, obviously. But I, wanted, I had a lot of questions. I'm like, so how does it work? Is it just like, <laughs> here, here you go. This is uh, the universe. The, th- the thing is, I get, I get the feeling, and you could probably make the same joke about Christians feeling like we're hearing from God. Okay, to be fair. But I, I want to understand, so if you believe, if you don't believe in God and you believe in the universe, in what way does the universe have a personal agency where, where the universe is trying or cares for your life in such a way that, that it's going to give you what your heart desires? I really don't understand. Do you mean the universe universe it seems to me you're talking about god but you don't want to talk about god and and then you hear a lot of language of manifesting i'm sure you've heard this manifesting well if i just if i do this thing and i follow the formula i'm going to manifest and this is all this goes way back to like the secret if you remember that the manifesting what i want in life which to me honestly it just sounds like and maybe maybe you want to call me and we have a meeting and and talk about this but it sounds to me a little bit like magic genie spirituality. It does. It sounds like if I rub the genie bottle, if I say the magic code, if I do the magic thing, I get everything my heart desires. Which, going back to what my heart desires, is a problem. So the problem with about love is about following your heart is to remember that my heart is sin-broken. And my heart wants all sorts of things that it shouldn't want. In fact, it has led me to be a slave to sin in many ways. It's led me in moments where I felt absolutely trapped because of sin. Absolutely stuck. Anybody that's struggled with addiction or anything like that, you know what I'm talking about. Your heart can want all sorts of things. It doesn't mean they're the right things for you. So I think this is a code that needs some work. And this is our last code in this series. Is that God-sized love is about following your heart wherever it leads. I think that's a problem. Now, you may ask, what does this have to do with, the, with Jesus 
And the Jesus source code, right? It has everything to do with it. More on that in a minute. Okay, let's do this little exercise. How would you define love? How would you define love? Turn to the person next to you. Ten seconds. How do you define love? Go. If there's no one next to you, talk to your alternate personality. <laughs> it's fine. It's all fine. We're all fine. I mean, that's the real question, right? What, how are we defining love? Like, what's our baseline for love? What are we talking about? Is it, is it a feeling? Is it an action? Is it a certain behavior? Maybe it's more than a feeling. Cue the music. Here's how I get to the answer to that question. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. One of the foundational truths that we believe about God is that he is perfect love. He is perfect love. In him there is no darkness at all. He is what love is supposed to be. He is the ultimate of love. And everything he does is out of love. And I was always taught in math class, I don't remember everything from math class. I know there's at least one math expert, expert in the room. She's up there working everything up there. But what I, they taught me when I would do a word problem, I don't, do they still teach this? I do a word problem, that when you see the word is, you put an equal sign. You guys remember this? You're like, eh. God equals love. If you just allow your mind to think about what that means, one of the things that it means is that if God is the embodiment of love, then everything he does is out of love. Everything. Because he's the embodiment. He wouldn't be perfect love if he sometimes did stuff that wasn't from love. So track with me here. And if we believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, which we do. That's the thing that makes us Christian, by the way. That's the one theological point that makes us Christian. Believe in the Trinity. Then you could also say Jesus equals love. Now let's follow this train of thought. Jesus, therefore, doesn't just love perfectly. Of course he did. He loved people perfectly. But he is perfect love. He equals perfect love. The love by which all other love is measured. So I'm going to start here with the definition. This is how I define love. Jesus. That's love. What he did. What he said. Everything. He is what love looks like. If I ever want to know, what does love look like? I go to Jesus. That's what it looks like. In every situation he was in, that's perfect love at work. So for example, everything I do is an expression of me. Newsflash. Everything I do is an expression of me. So, you know, I'm going to Sickles, where I see half of you after the service anyways. <laughs> or I'm going, <laughs> you know, I'm going to my kid's school, I'm going to work, I'm driving in New Jersey traffic. I'm me the whole time. And so everything I do is an expression of me. Good, bad, and ugly. It wasn't somebody else doing the thing, it's me. So just follow the train of thought here. If Jesus is love, everything he does is an expression of perfect love. Everything. Everything. Here's the point. Love isn't always pleasant, and it's not always nice. Jesus wasn't always pleasant and nice to the people around him. So perfect love, or love itself, isn't just about the wanting, the pleasure, the nice things, the happy things, the things my heart desires. There's something more, isn't there? Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, 
so have I loved you. Now, hang on to that idea about the fathers. Jesus is always referring to his obedience to the Father, and this is really important. Also super confusing. Wait a minute, isn't Jesus God? Yes, but there's some hierarchy happening where he talks about obeying the Father's will, and that's because he's showing us how to do it. He's showing us what it looks like to live a life of faith, obeying the Father. So in everything he does, he does it in perfect love and perfect obedience to the Father. He says, now remain in my love. How do you do it? If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have... Oh, back. Not done reading. There you go. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Don't miss this. Love each other as I have loved you. And start to get your head around what that means. And how deep that runs. He even says it. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Now watch this. You are my friends if you do what I command. If you love one another like I love you, like my father has loved, if you love one another like that, he's basically saying, I'm not just your Lord and Savior, I consider you a friend. What? The creator of all things? A friend? That's what Jesus says. Love isn't just about whatever feels good. It sometimes is about it, but not always because it runs so much deeper than that. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. So how has he loved us? Sometimes his love looks like confronting us. Sometimes his love does look like discipline. Sometimes it doesn't seem very pleasant to be confronted with God's love. But it is perfect love in action. Look at this from John chapter 12, just kind of capturing Jesus' posture of love toward the people he was talking to. He said this, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? So first of all, Jesus is perfect love, and yet his soul is troubled. Somehow that is an expression of perfect love in the face of absence of faith or in the face of what Jesus was going through. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. What? Wait a minute. I thought you were talking about perfect love here. More on that in a minute. Judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Wait, death? Painful, sacrificial death? Yes, part of perfect love. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. So, how does Jesus love us? I mean, just get a sense of what he's talking about in that passage alone. He challenges, he rebukes, he sacrifices, and yes, even judgment. Well, wait a minute, how does that, I thought we're not supposed to judge. Judgment doesn't sound like love. If Jesus is love, everything he does is love. 
So what about judgment? Let's just camp out here on this, on this idea. I want you to consider this. If God's love had no judgment, it wouldn't be love, would it? It wouldn't be love. Because love must include justice. Sin has to be punished. I don't, I don't think it's very loving to say, all right, humanity, just like whatever. You're all in anyways. It doesn't matter what you do. Good, bad, evil, eh, meh. I'm not even watching. That's not love. It's like with your kids. You're not going to, like, not discipline your kids. That's not love. Just, or, like, giving them whatever they want without any sort of guidelines or structure. That's not good. That's not love. Like when I'm six years old, and I had a play date. They didn't call it that back then. They just call it playing. <laughs> with, my, with my friend Seth. I don't remember a lot about six years old, but I remember this vividly. So we're over at his house, and Seth had the kind of parents that didn't watch. I, we probably could have done anything. Case in point, we were in this room, and we had, we had a bed, and we had a couch. They were across from each other, and we thought this was a really good idea to try to jump from one to the other and see if we could make it. This was great fun. Until I, with my Air Jordan-esque vertical, and distance jump, I jumped right through the plate glass window. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's a whole thing. I remember it vividly. That's not love. Love isn't just, okay, just destroy yourselves. I'm going to go in here and have something to eat. Love necessarily includes justice. There is a, such a thing as good and evil, and evil must be eradicated. It must be punished. It must be dealt with. So yeah, judgment is a part of it. So I think this is how we fix the code. Fixing this code is to say God's size love isn't about following your heart wherever it leads. It's about following the Father's heart wherever it leads. That's God's size love. That's what it looks like to believe in Jesus, to believe that it's not just about what you want, not my will, but yours be done. It's about following the Father's heart, which is what Jesus did perfectly, which led him to some not-so-happy experiences. The Father's heart led him to Gethsemane, led him to pray a prayer that said, I don't want to do this, but if that's what you want, your will be done. And what if he didn't? What if he wasn't perfectly obedient? What if he himself wasn't perfect love that'd be willing to sacrifice for us? Following the Father's heart. Again, a heart that beats in rhythm with God's. That's what it looks like to follow Jesus. And I'll say this. I, it doesn't sound rosy to say it that way. Because, again, I'd rather manifest all the money and the, all the stuff, all the things I want. But none of that ever leads me to a place of peace, joy, and faith, ever. Never. Because what you discover is, let's say you do receive what you want, you're just going to keep wanting. It doesn't end. Because that very thing that you're looking for is a deep and abiding relationship with your Maker. And when you have that, you have it all. Following the Father's heart wherever it leads. It just repeated that verse. Go to the next one. So can my sin-broken heart love like Jesus, perfect love naturally? You know the answer. Eh. No, because it, again, is sin broken. Now, it doesn't mean I'm incapable of good. 
I believe that there is something of a common grace that we all have, whether you believe in Jesus or not, where we have the capacity to do good things and be good, decent people and be generous and all of that. It's part, because we're all made in the image of God, it's like a residual image of our Heavenly Father that we all have. You've all met people who aren't Christians and they're some of the nicest, most generous people. It's because we all have been given that. But none of us do it in the perfection of Jesus Christ. None of us do it in accordance completely to what our Father's heart wants. Therefore, we need a new heart. This is the thing that's hardest to explain. Do you know what's hardest to explain to? Church people. People have been going to church their whole life, and they're so used to experiencing God in a certain way that I tell them it's, it's a fully hearts on fire. You know that scripture on the road to Emmaus when those disciples were talking to Jesus, but they didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus is talking scripture to them, and at the end they say, were not our hearts burning within us when he spoke to us and taught us about the scripture? It's, it's a heart on fire burning for the love of God. And I don't mean it like makes you an absolute fanatic and you know, you're going to shave your head and dose. It's none of that. Although we came close to some dancing here this morning. I don't know. In that prelude, I thought a tambourine was going to sprout. <laughs> no, it's about how am I going full out in my life with God? Full out. Faith, full out. No governor on it. No restrictions. How do I love God fully? Now, I'm not going to do it perfectly. I rely on God's grace for that. He's going to cover the distance between the two. But what I need to do is to live it fully, forward. Now, I don't know about you, and I don't know how this series has landed in your life, but I just want to ask, who is Jesus to you? Is he a religious obligation? Maybe you're still seeking. You don't know who Jesus is, and I'm so glad you're here. God can handle your questions. It's okay. He never kicked anybody out for having questions. In fact, that's what leads to a deeper faith in the first place. But maybe there's part of the code that needs a little fixing. Maybe you wonder, what's that thing that's been missing? And maybe it's your heart. You could do all the things, but has your heart been made new? How do you do that? You just ask God. God, I believe in you. I put my faith in you. I still have my questions. Give me a new heart. Maybe it's not the universe, but the creator of the universe who's been calling. Maybe he's the one that's going to give you not just what your heart desires, but what your heart needs. I promise you this, if you keep searching, if you keep working on the code, and you find the real Jesus, he's going to be more than you imagined. And that's the version of Jesus you could trust your life with. Amen.